good day. I am Nadine Talavera and I will be presenting our paper entitled Elucidation of the Current Voltage Response to Infrared Invisible Radiation of Carbon Nanotube Films Using UVV's Spectrometry. This study aims to analyze the absorption spectra of single-walled carbon nanotubes and investigate the behavior of their IV curves on their thermal and optical variations. The device was fabricated by drop casting two types of CNTs on an n-type silicon substrate. For device one, the absorber used this e dip synthesized CNT, while for device two, a commercial CNT was used. The IVI versus T measurement were performed using four-point probe measurement setup, while the absorption spectra of CNTs were obtained using UVV's spectrophotometer. The IV curves of the two devices under IR and red laser both showed a nonlinearity indicative of its semiconducting nature. Comparatively, the response of device 2, that is its change in resistance and voltage, is higher than that of device 1, making it a more efficient device. The IV versus T curves of device 2 also showed a more consistent and higher voltage change with respect to temperature change as compared to device 1. Hence, we can conclude that device 2 is more semiconducting. The TCR and thermal conductance values obtained were also shown in Table 1. The absorption spectra of the two CNTs also showed that CNTSA exhibits a higher absorbance and absorption coefficient for the wavelength range of 600 to 11 nanometers. Caution fitting of the spectra also showed that CNTSA has more abundant semiconducting species under its curve at 661 nanometer, but its peak almost coinciding with that of the semiconducting species. In conclusion, better performance is obtained by using absorber with abundant semiconducting species and high absorbance and absorption coefficient. Thank you. Good day, I am Riz Matisilia and today I will be presenting our study on the synthesis and characterization of polyaniline with varying concentrations of hydrochloric acid and acetic acid. The outline of my presentation is as follows, and the objective of this study is to synthesize polyaniline and to investigate the structure and composition of poly samples through FTIR. Its significance is to maximize the potential of polyaniline for biomedical applications. For the methodology, Pure aniline and ammonium persulfate was prepared separately, then mixed with varying concentrations of HCl and acetic acid into a flask to commence polymerization. The solutions were mixed in an ice bath until greenish black precipitates are formed. The samples were left to continue polymerization overnight, and the synthesized products were filtered, washed, and then air dried. This is the sample codes for different polymerization conditions, and this is the FTIR machine used for characterization. Figure 1 and 2 shows the characteristic peaks of PANI doped with HCl and acetic acid, respectively, where it can be observed that there is a slight shift to the left of the characteristic peaks of all PANI samples. Table 2 shows the degrees of oxidation of the samples. From this, it can be observed that PANI 1E has the high, lowest degree of oxidation, while PANI 1A has the highest. This indicates that the degree of oxidation decreases with increasing HCl concentration. In Table 3, PANI 2A has the lowest degree of oxidation, while PANI 2B has the highest. The rest of the PANI samples show decreasing degree of oxidation. In conclusion, FTIR spectra show that among all the samples synthesized, PANI 1, C1, D2, B2, C, and 2D exhibit characteristic peaks of the base form of polyaniline, while PANI 2A has the lowest oxidation out of all samples, which indicates that it is an emeraldine salt form of PANI. However, further characterization techniques and conductivity measurements are necessary to confirm these claims. Here are my references, and thank you for listening. I am Maria Roxanne Biebikebil, and I will be presenting our work entitled Synthesis and Characterization of Polyaniline Powders with Varying Concentrations of Acetic Acid and Ammonium Persulfate. The outline of my presentation is as follows. The objectives of our work are to synthesize PANI powders and to characterize each sample using FTIR. The significance of this study lies in the future potential of PANI for medical applications. For the methodology, in the first image is the aniline solution preparation. In the second image is the APS solution preparation. The two solutions were mixed to commence polymerization. The reaction was kept under constant steering in an ice bath until greenish-black precipitates begin to form. The synthesized products were then filtered and washed. 
the samples were air dried and labeled according to composition as shown in Table 1. So here is the FDIR equipment. Figures 2 to 4 show the FDIR spectra of panis synthesized from each concentration of acetic acid with varied concentrations of APS solution. Table 2 shows the FDIR peak assignment of PANI samples. In conclusion, the band attributed to CN stretching shifted to lower wave number with increasing APS solution, except PANI 3A, suggesting that increasing the concentration of the APS solution can decrease electrical conductivity. Furthermore, the studied acetic acid concentrations do not affect the spectral features of PANI. Figures 5 to 7 depict the FTIR spectra of PANI samples for each APS solution concentration with varied concentrations of acetic acid. Table 3 shows the benzenoid kenoid ratio of PANI powders. In conclusion, all PANI A's and B's exhibit base form. Moreover, all PANI C's having lower degrees of oxidation may be emeraldine salt form. Finally, further characterization techniques and conductivity measurement are necessary to confirm these claims. Negative effects of industrialization have led researchers to explore alternative materials that are both eco-friendly and sustainable. Locally, bamboo has been used as a structural component of buildings due to its high strength and low weight, but its use is limited by its high moisture absorption, which eventually causes deterioration. To prevent this, bamboo is usually treated using known methods like soaking in a solution containing borax and boric acid. This reduces flame spread and catalyzes dehydration and other oxygen-eliminating reactions in wood. In this study, we investigate the thermal and structural properties of bamboo treated with two electrolyte solutions, borax, boric acid solution, and saltwater solution, through the soap diffusion technique. Treated and untreated bamboo samples were subjected to thermogravimetric analysis from room temperature to 800 degrees Celsius. The structural changes were monitored using Fourier transform IR spectroscopy. The TJ curve exhibits three gradients indicating weight loss of different bamboo components. The gradient from 200 to 300 degrees Celsius is due to the composition of hemi cellulose. From 300 to 350 degrees Celsius, pyrolysis and a composition of cellulose. And finally, a temperature is higher than 350 degrees Celsius and a composition of lignin. These decomposition events were also observed through FDIR spectra. Some images show that the integrity of treated bamboo fibers was retained after being heated to 320 degrees Celsius. To quantify the flame retardancy of the samples, we calculated the residual char using weight loss values from TTJ data. The higher the residual char value is, the better the flame retardancy. And this is apparent in the residual char calculated for borax boric acid treated bamboo. Still, saltwater treatment is a viable alternative because it is safer and more economical. What would you do if you wanted to recognize and confirm his or her identity? You look for their fingerprints. The clearer the fingerprint, the better. For molecules, you detect its so-called Raman spectrum. What if the signal is weak and you wanted to detect, for example, a pollutant or a certain virus? Thankfully, we have a technique called Surface Enhanced Raman Scattering, or SIRS. Hello everyone, I am Joven Angles and here is our research entitled SIRS Enhancement Factor of Gold Nanoparticle Graphene Substrates. We enhance the recognition capabilities by enhancing the Raman signal or its fingerprint. Gold nanoparticles enhance the signal on its surface when excited by a laser. Here's the catch. The molecule must be on the surface of the nanoparticle. Here we add the graphene. Due to its absorption capabilities, it can act as a molecular net. However, would it affect the signal? Here, we use the finite element method to solve how much Raman signal is amplified using these boundary conditions and equations. The model simulates a Raman spectroscopy setup. We found that direct coupling between graphene and gold nanoparticles themselves is limited, and graphene will have a minimal effect on the enhancement factor of gold. Therefore, we can tailor the morphology of gold to produce the maximum signal enhancement without worrying about the post-integration effects of graphene. 
The key to increasing the source signal is a reliable nanoparticle design. Our study used numerical modeling to predict its optimal performance. And in turn, reducing its cost by reducing the number of samples during the development stage. Beyond this, it can also be used to predict how it will perform once in operation. Here are our references and thank you for listening. Hello, I'm Frederick C. Gila, and I would like to report our study dealing with the Monte Carlo simulations of high-energy electrons incident in capacaraginan-based hydrogels. Electron beams are widely used to induce changes in irradiated materials. For instance, in the Philippines, electron beam irradiation has led to the production of very novel products such as plant growth promoters and hemostats based on capacaraginan. For irradiation of a material in electron beams, the most important parameter is the absorbed dose or the energy per unit mass. The purpose of this study is to get the absorbed dose distribution in capacaraginan using Monte Carlo simulations. This is a very accurate method to determine absorbed dose distributions. In this work, we used MCNP5 to model high energy electrons incident in the capacaraginan hydrogel samples. Our results are plotted in the right as a function of the depth within the caraginan. Surprisingly, the dose is increasing due to the cascading amount of electrons as it passes through the caraginan sample. Our second set of results show a 2D mesh of the capacaraginan sample, showing that the dose in the edges are lower because of the lack of scattering materials in the edges. We use Monte Carlo simulations in this study to get the absorbed dose in the capacaraginan samples. This absorbed dose is very important because it is directly related to the amount of cross-linking made by the radiation to the material. Therefore, this highlights the use of Monte Carlo simulations to get absorbed doses. Thank you for your time.